All right, so if you join me in John chapter 19, and while you're turning there, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we heard the cries of the crucified Christ. We heard a cry of unimaginable agony. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we heard a cry of victory. It is finished. And we heard a cry of peace and communion with the Father. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And that time frame that we were looking at was in the afternoon, between noon and 3 p.m., which means Jesus was on the cross for six hours. And now as we move forward, uh, the Christ is buried. And we're con- going to consider the next three-hour time slice from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And we're going to start in John chapter 19, verse 31, which says, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So Jesus gave up the ghost after those three cries. He gave up the ghost at 3 p.m. on this Passover, which is the fulfillment of the prophetic nature of Passover. Elsewhere, lots, lots of people in Jerusalem. Elsewhere, the Jewish people were finishing their preparations for the Passover, which involved their lamb having been inspected for four days, their lamb being slain, their lamb being roasted with fire, and their lamb being eaten. All of that before 6 p.m., which would be the beginning of night in accordance with Exodus chapter 12. And so now here at Calvary, we have the Pharisees, we have scribes, we have Sadducees, we have the elders who have been watching Jesus suffer and die on the cross, and they have things to do. And so they, it says the Jews, remember it's the rulers referred to as the Jews in the Gospel of John, uh, they go to Pilate and request that he expedite the deaths of these three men by breaking their legs. Why would they do that? Well, because they don't want to break the law, which blows my mind. These are law breakers, but they don't want to break the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, the law says, And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is cursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. These three men, they're all Jews. They have to die. They have to be taken off the cross before the end of the day. And it's, that's, there's three hours left. And so uh, they, they go, to the, go to Pilate. Because the next day is the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 16, it says, In the first day there shall be a holy convocation. This is speaking of Passover. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. There's not to be any work done on, on the Sabbath. And, and taking someone down from the cross and burying them is work. So they have to get this done before 6 p.m. And in that verse, we heard the first day and the last day of Passover unleavened bread. They're kind of grouped together. They are both Sabbath days. And it doesn't matter if they fall on Saturday or not. Whenever they fall, whatever day they fall on is a Sabbath, which is why it's called a a high Sabbath. Any Sabbath that's not Saturday is a high Sabbath. And so they say we can't do any work on the Sabbath, and so we need these men to die. The hypocrisy 
is mind-blowing. You know, we look around at the political scene in our country and we're kind of blown away by the hypocrisy of the politicians. Nothing new under the sun. Always been that way. So, these men have to die so that they can be buried and this whole thing can be wrapped up by 6 o'clock. How long it took for a person to die on the Roman cross varied from person to person. If a person was old and unhealthy, it could have been a couple of hours. But if the person was young and healthy, it could be upwards of four days. Now, where did Jesus fit on that spectrum? Young, healthy, it could take days. Uh, And how did someone die on the cross? Ultimately, they would be so weakened that they wouldn't be able to push themselves up to breathe, so they would suffocate. Just the sheer torment and exhaustion, no doubt producing hopelessness, leading to suffocation. And anybody ever got the wind knocked out of you? There's a, there's a moment of panic, right? Right? You know, we got to breathe. Uh, when you're suffocating, there, there's panic. Uh, death came when they could no longer boost themselves up to breathe. And the Jews knew that if you broke the legs, they wouldn't be able to push themselves up to breathe, and death would come quickly. Uh, they want to bury these three men, which is somewhat different than how the Romans thought. The Romans didn't bury people they crucified. Instead, they left their bodies on the cross to rot and to be vulture chow, if you will. Why would they do that? Well, to maximize the horror of daring to oppose the Roman Empire. They did it all for effect. The Jews didn't go that way. Verse 32, Then came the soldiers... And break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. So the Jews go to Pilate and say, uh, we, we got to get this thing done, so break their legs. Uh, Pilate agrees, and he sends soldiers to break their legs. How did the Romans do that? Well, they did it with either a very large hammer or an iron club. And if you're on the cross and your, your legs need to be broken so you can't push yourself up to breathe, what bones are they going to strike? Your shins. Anybody ever got whacked on the shins? Awful. So who do they go to? They go to the two thieves. They go to the one who was on the right. They go to the one who was on the left of Jesus because he was in the midst and break their legs, and they're going to die quickly. Uh, By the way, after they die, what is one of them going to hear? Welcome to paradise, my son, right? Because Jesus has given up the ghost. Where is he? He's in paradise. There's one following him shortly. Verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. All right, so they've they've broken vicious. Uh, They've broken the legs of the two thieves, and now the soldiers turn their attention to Jesus. But they find what? He's already dead. What does the testimony of God, what does the record of God say about Jesus He's dead. He died on the cross. He did not pass out. He did not swoon. He died. He laid down his life just like he said he would in John chapter 10. Now, the soldiers, Roman soldiers, who are absolutely ignorant about the word of God, uh, They didn't bother breaking his legs because there would be no point in doing so. But what did they do? One of them pierced his side 
with a spear. Why would they do that? Well, first of all, we have to understand the spear. This is not a a weapon of war, a big, heavy weapon. This was a lance. It was thin, it was slender, and it was used by the Romans not during the battle, but after the battle to go around the battlefield to see if any of these casualties were only wounded or maybe playing dead because they would leave nobody alive. And so it was one of those spears. Question, was Jesus playing dead? No. No. And from his wound in the side, which means between the ribs, came blood and water, which are the the fluids around the heart and the lungs. Now, the physiology, and there's someone here who could talk a whole lot more intelligently about that than I, but the physiology of this is hypovolemic shock, right? Did I say it correctly? How about that? Uh, What that is an indication of is low blood volume. Remember how badly Jesus was beaten. The scourging, the beating, the pulling of the beard, uh, the crown of thorns. Nailed to a cross. He lost a lot of blood. And he lost a lot of blood before he even was crucified. Remember, as they were leaving the praetorium on their way to Golgotha, Jesus carried his cross until he couldn't. And that's because of a loss of blood. Uh, When he was on the cross, one of the seven things he said is, I thirst, an indication of uh, hypovolemic shock the body desiring to replenish the fluids that had been lost. And hypovolemic shock also causes fluid to gather around the sac surrounding the heart and surrounding the lungs. And so this pier, this, this sword that's pierced in his side and it's probably his right side because of the lungs and the heart there uh, resulted in the flow of blood and water. Uh, Jesus' heart, maybe quite literally, but absolutely was pierced. And that in ways we will never know. And so, where does that leave us? Jesus died on the cross. And from his death came the fluids of of birth. What, what fluids come out during childbirth? Blood and water. And that's the topic, if you will, of our next study. When we finish the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, we're going to do the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which will be from Acts 1 to the end of Revelation in its chronological order. And we'll be at it for a while. But that's the next study. Verse 35 of John chapter 19 says, And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith it true, that ye might believe. Who is the he that saw these things? Well, that would be the Apostle John. The only, so far in the record of God, the only friendlies who are there at Calvary witnessing the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ are the women and the Apostle John. And so the Apostle John is bearing record. He's giving testimony of verses 31 through 34 that says that Jesus was already dead. The soldiers did not break his legs and they did pierce his side. Jesus is the Lamb of God the promised Messiah, the Christ who died on a cross, John is bearing record of it. And if you join me, we're coming back here, of course, but if you join me in 1 John, the first epistle of John, chapter 5. The first epistle of John was inspired, it was recorded, to combat the growth of Gnosticism that infected the early church that introduced heresies 
into Christianity, heresies like denying the deity of Jesus Christ and denying that Jesus died on the cross. Instead, he just passed out. He swooned. Those heresies were introduced into the church before the end of the first century. And the first epistle of John is written to combat those heresies. In 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 6, it says, This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth, water and blood. He was born. The Word became flesh. Planted, prepared, a body was prepared for him in the womb of a virgin. Verse 7, for these are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. When he died, the Messiah died. And these three agree in one. And so back to John chapter 19, John is saying, I saw these things. And I know what I saw. And I'm writing these things down so that you will know and that you will believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yes, he died on the cross. Verse 36 of John chapter 19. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Who, who pierced the side of Jesus? Who did not break his bones? The Roman soldiers. They're biblically ignorant. They have no idea that what they're doing was foretold by Scripture centuries before. All the way back to Moses in Exodus chapter 12, the first Passover, which was a shadow of this Passover. It says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. The Passover lamb is not to have any bones broken. When that law was repeated, well, while Israel was wandering around in the wilderness, in Numbers chapter 9, verse 12, the instruction for God reads, shall leave none of it, the Passover lamb, unto morning, nor break any bone of it. Were any of Jesus' bones broken? No. The Roman soldiers didn't do it. They had no idea what they were doing, or not doing, as the case may be. And, however, they did pierce his side, Fulfilling, in part, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This is prophetic scripture yet to be fulfilled. We're looking into the future on this one. But he was pierced. The interesting thing there is... That Hebrew word in Zechariah chapter 12 means, pierced, means stabbed. In Psalm 22, verse 16, talking about his hands and feet being pierced, that's another Hebrew word, which means violently. So two different words pierced. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, the piercing is being stabbed. It's just being fulfilled by the soldier who was checking to see if Jesus was really dead. So, these things being done by the hands of biblically ignorant Romans, who's in charge? Is man? Is Satan? No, how about the Lord God Almighty? Completely in control. Verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, 
about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So he has died. He must be buried before 6 p.m. Who does that? Men. Remember, so far in the record of God, the only friendlies who've been watching this are the women and John. Taking someone off the cross, that's, that's heavy-duty work. And so men are doing it, and they're also friendlies. And they're now entering into God's testimony of what has happened. And the first guy is named Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. And how is he described? He's a disciple of Jesus. And what are the adjectives before that? Secret. Fear. He is a secret, fearful disciple of Jesus. But he has access to Pilate. And he uses it. Uh, The second man who is involved in taking Jesus off the cross and burying him is Nicodemus, whom we first run into in chapter 3. When he came to Jesus at night, and he was a teacher of the people. Uh, And he said to Jesus, we know that you are a teacher come from God, because no man can do these miracles that you do, but God be with him. And then Jesus spoke to him, and what was the very first thing Jesus said to him? You must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born of the Spirit of God. Of God. And in the course of the conversation, he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. As the serpent was lifted up by Moses in the desert, the Son of Man must be lifted. He must be crucified. This is two years ago. Why must the Son of Man be lifted up? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son Whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, because the world's already condemned, but rather that the world through him might be saved. These words were spoken by Jesus to Nicodemus two years previously. But if you flip with me to John chapter 7, we also run into Nicodemus at the Feast of Tabernacles about six months ago. John chapter 7, starting in verse 43. So there was a division among the people because of him, because of Jesus. And some of them would have taken him but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? They were sent to arrest Jesus, but they didn't. And the officers answered, Never man spoke like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law, are cursed. Wait a minute, who doesn't know the law? (laughs) The ones speaking, the Pharisees, of which one is named Nicodemus. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? And they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went into his own house. You see, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He was shamed. He was publicly shamed. He was shouted down. He had peer pressure poured all over him by the other Pharisees regarding Jesus. And now, six months later, in chapter 19, we see him again. He's come to help Joseph of Arimathea take the body of Jesus down and to bury it. And he brings a mixture of spices for burial. How much did he bring? About 100 pounds. What does that mean? Well, 
some cultural context is required. The Jews generally buried someone with half their body weight of spices. Therefore, Jesus weighed, if that be true, Jesus weighed about 200 pounds. Was Jesus some wimp? No. No, not at all. He was anything but. So now we have two secret disciples of Jesus taking his body off the cross, which would have been a really bloody job. Uh, and now they've, they're going to spice the body, which is just the initial part of burying the body, and they've wrapped it in linen clothes. Verse 41 of John chapter 19. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein never man yet laid. They laid the, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So now we get some initial burial details. Uh, first of all, there's a garden near by, which is significant because the clock is running, if you will. Uh, they only have so much time to bury him before they would then be working on the Sabbath and breaking the Sabbath. And so nearby is a garden. Interesting. Death, separation from God. Where did Adam die? In a garden. Where was the second Adam laid to rest? In a garden. Our problem, mankind's problem, started in a garden and it was resolved in another garden. And where specifically in this garden? In a sepulcher, a tomb. What kind of a tomb? Brand spanking new. Never been used by anybody. A virgin. Jesus was buried in a virgin tomb as he was carried in a virgin womb. And no one preceded him. And I don't think anyone followed him after. That was a one-time use tomb. And you know what's really cool about that? We've been in it. You're going to be in it. It's mind-blowing. Now, let's go to a parallel account in Mark chapter 15. And it, the narrative resumes in verse 42 of Mark 15. And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath. Again, we have to remember the time frame that we're looking at this morning is the evening from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Everything has to be all buttoned up regarding these three men before 6 p.m. if they're to keep the Sabbath. Verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. So we get some more details about Joseph of Arimathea. It says he's an honorable counselor. He's an honest judge. He's a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy, who were rulers, who were judges. He's an honest, he's an honorable judge in Israel. And we're told also that he waited for the kingdom of God as preached by the king of that kingdom. He was a disciple of Jesus. And he was, we, from the previous account, he was a secret disciple. But now, how do we see him going into Pilate? 
boldly. Not secret anymore. Not fearful anymore. He went boldly to beg for the body of Jesus. And Pilate's response is interesting. First of all, Pilate marveled. He wondered. Wait a minute. Jesus? The body of Jesus? He's young. He's healthy. It's going to take him six, you know, upwards of four days to die. He's already dead? Whoa. It's only been six hours. And so what does he do? He calls for a witness that Jesus is in fact dead. He calls for the centurion. So he sends someone from the praetorium out to Calvary to get the centurion who walks from Calvary back to the praetorium uh, to tell Pilate if this be true. And this is the centurion who heard everything Jesus said on the cross. This is the centurion who witnessed all the way up there in, you know, verses 37 through 30. He witnessed the fact that his legs were, that he gave up the ghost. His legs were not broken. His side was pierced. And he also testified, truly, this man was the son of God. And so he came and he bore witness to Pilate that, yes, Jesus of Nazareth is dead dead on the cross. And so Pilate gave Joseph the body. Verse 46, And he brought fine linen and took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of rock and rolled a stone onto the door of the sepulcher. So in Mark's account, we get some additional burial details. We get a description of the linen. It's fine linen linen. It's bleached white linen. And he took the body. He, remember, he had help <laughs> with Nicodemus. They took the body of Jesus down and put, put yourself there. Who's watching them do that? Uh, the friendlies, the women, the apostle John, also the hostels. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the elders, they're all watching Joseph and Nicodemus take this body down. And they take the body of Jesus to a tomb. And where is this tomb? It's in a garden, but it is chiseled out of rock. Hand chiseled out of rock, which is a very expensive proposition. And they place the body there, and then they roll a stone over the door to seal it. Verse 47. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. Now, these are some of the women who have been watching there the entire time. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, in another account known as Mary, the wife of Cleophas. Uh, They follow Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb. They're eyewitnesses to the burial process, how they're doing it. They're eyewitnesses to where the burial is. What tomb? Now let's go to Mark, excuse me, Matthew chapter 27. We get all the details by considering all the accounts. In Matthew chapter 27, we resume in verse 57. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. So now we learn something additional about Joseph. He is a rich man. Verse 58. He went to Pilate. And begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a linen, a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. So, some more details about the burial of Jesus in Matthew's account. The linen is referred to as clean. It's pure. 
I don't know this, but I believe it to be true. I believe it to be virgin linen, never used before for anything. Jesus was carried in a virgin womb. He was buried in a virgin tomb, and he was wrapped in virgin linen. And we learn about this tomb. Whose tomb is it? It's Joseph's. It's his own tomb. He's getting ready for his own death. But he's a rich man. And chiseling a tomb out of rock, which is a very expensive thing to do, he could afford to do it. It's his. And then we see that he departed, which tells me that he and Nicodemus helping him finished the burial chore before 6 p.m. And then they went home. And in so doing, they have fulfilled Scripture about the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 61. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. And we know from Mark's account, this is Mary Magdalene and this is Mary, the the mother of Joseph, the wife of Cleophas. They are watching everything very carefully. And it's interesting to me that they're there until the very end. They were there at the beginning and they're there to the very end. And we'll see next week that they're going to be there at the new beginning also. Now, in Luke chapter 23. This account starts in verse 50. Luke 23, verse 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor. And he was a good man and a just The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. More details about Joseph. Uh, He's described in the testimony of God as good, just, righteous. How is anybody good and just and righteous before God? By faith. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. The just shall live by faith. He had faith. Faith in Jesus. And he opposed the counsel of Caiaphas, railroading the crucifixion of Jesus. But how did he oppose it? Silently. We're also told that Arimathea is a town of the Jews, and if you look on a map, it's, it's northwest of Jerusalem in the province of Judea. He didn't have too far to come. Verse 52. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So in Luke's account, we get some additional details about the burial of Jesus, and it is It's pretty much the last verse there in verse 56. It revolves around the women. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, who had witnessed everything from the moment he was crucified to he gave up the ghost, to the taking down of the body, to the preparing him for burial, for the taking him to the sepulcher, for laying down, rolling the stone. They watched everything. And then they also departed before 6 p.m. But as I read verse 56... It it tells me that until 6 p.m., they prepared 
additional spices, additional ointments to finish the job, to properly bury Jesus. It's been hastily done this day because they're on the clock. Uh, Hasn't been done completely, hasn't been done properly. They're going to finish the job and they prepare additional burial spices. But at 6 p.m., they stopped. They stopped working. They rested in order to keep the law. Now, let's go back to Matthew chapter 27 because not only did they witness these things, so did some hostile witnesses. Remember, the hostile witnesses are the Jews, meaning the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, the rulers. And they've witnessed, they've been eyewitnesses of two of their own. Joseph of Arimathea, who is of the Sanhedrin, and Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and of the Sanhedrin. They've witnessed two of their own take the body down and bury it in a tomb. Joseph's tomb. In Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. So we have the chief priests, Annas and Caiaphas. They were Sadducees. And the Pharisees, so we have the Sadducees and the Pharisees together. They're worried. They've witnessed two of their own take the body of Jesus down, prepare it for burial, and take it to one of their own tombs and put him there. And they've been thinking. They've taken counsel again. So here we are. They didn't have time before 6 p.m. So... Probably right about 6 a.m., 12 hours from now, uh, they go to Pilate. They're still working. The problem. They're breaking the Sabbath. Uh, They demand something from Pilate. And what they say is very telling. First of all, they say, sir, which is a term of respect. Do they have any respect for Pilate? They're hypocrites. Sir, we remember. What does that mean? They heard and they understood what Jesus said. We remember while he was yet alive. What's their testimony? He's dead. And they called him that deceiver. Because they believe he did things by the power of the devil, not by the power of God. They believe Jesus was the son of Lucifer, not the son of God. And But however they are witnessing that he died on the cross. And what he said that they remember, and they understood because of this request, after three days I will rise again. They understood They heard, they understood, and they remembered what Jesus said to them, I believe, two years previously. Let's go to the left, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 34. Jesus is speaking, he's speaking to them. O generation of vipers! How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And they've said a whole bunch of them this last day. For by thy words thou shalt be justified... And by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Uh, They've condemned themselves. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign of thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, 
and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What did Jesus tell them? He was going to die and rise again from the dead. And so now, here in Matthew chapter 27, they heard it, they understood it, they're worried about it, and so they go to Pilate. With what? Verse 64 of Matthew chapter 27. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. They've had a whole 12 hours to stew about this. They're worried. They go to Pilate. We need you to put Roman soldiers to secure the tomb, to prevent this fraud's disciples from coming during the night and stealing the body and then pointing to an empty tomb as if it's evidence that he's risen from the dead. Did they hear, did they understand what Jesus had said to them? Yes. Did they believe it? No. No, they did not believe it. And they're worried that this last fraud, which is the resurrection, would cause them greater harm than the first fraud, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. These are the children of the devil here. They think Jesus is the son of the devil. These are children of the devil. And they are conspiring in advance of he is risen to deny the empty tomb. Verse 65. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as ye can. Uh, This is the morning after the burial. 24 hours previously, these very same people had bullied Pilate. They'd manipulated him. They played him like a fiddle to execute an innocent man. So I don't think he's of any frame of mind to cooperate with them anymore. And so he tells them to get lost. No, it's your business. You have guards. You have temple police. Set your own watch. Now, interesting thing about Pilate. From here, he just kind of fades away from God's record. And we learn from uh, John Fox's Book of Martyrs that he was later reassigned from Jerusalem to Vienna. And in Vienna, he committed suicide. Not a a strong ending for Pilate. But anyway, he sends them away. You take care of it yourself. Verse 66. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting watch, which is exactly what they did. They put guards around the tomb. The, the stone was there. They put a stamp. They put a seal, if you will, somehow on the stone so that if the stone was moved, the seal would be broken and they would know something was afoot. But... I think they think they've taken care of it. They don't believe he's rising on the third day, and they're going to prevent his disciples from deceiving the people about that. And so I think off they troop, going home, breathing a sigh of relief. Took care of that last detail, and they're no doubt purring with pleasure. But of course, we know that's not the end of the story. But tonight, not tonight, this morning... We've considered the death and the burial of Jesus. So what? In the four accounts, we've been given a lot of information. So what? Well, I think the burial of Jesus asks six questions that demand answers. The first question How did man 
conspire to fulfill the words of God written centuries before and witnessed by both friendly and hostile witnesses. How did man, let's see, the Jews, the Romans, and Jesus, if he is not God, if he's just a man, how did man conspire to fulfill things God foretold that who the Christ would die with, the wicked, the two thieves, where the Christ would be buried with the rich in that tomb, that the legs of the Christ would not be broken and that the side of the Christ would be pierced. And that was witnessed by people friendly to Jesus and people hostile to Jesus. How did man conspire to do that? How do we explain these things happening? God's the only answer. He is the only answer. So that leads us to the second question. Do you believe God's testimony of the death and the burial of Jesus, the Christ. In John chapter 19, verse 5, uh, he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. Do you believe it? Isaiah 53, verse 1, who has believed our report? Who has believed our testimony? Who has believed our record? That the Christ would die was foretold in Genesis chapter 22 when a father was going to sacrifice his only beloved son. A shadow of what just happened. It was foretold in Psalm 22, recorded by David a thousand years before the event, describing a Roman crucifixion of which he would know nothing. It was foretold in Isaiah 53. God's suffering servant, God's sin sacrifice for man. It was foretold in the book of Jonah. Three days, three nights, and then resurrection. It's been recorded in all four Gospels. It is spoken of in Revelation chapter 1 when Jesus says, he, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Do you believe God's testimony of the death and the burial of Jesus Christ? I do. Third question, does it really matter that Christ died on the cross? What's the power of God? The power of life over death, resurrection. If Jesus' death was not real, there was no resurrection, right? If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For his resurrection to be real, so must his death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. Starting in verse 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain... And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be, the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. 
if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The Christ had to die to be raised from the dead. And it's the power of God given unto us, victory over death in the resurrection of the Christ who died on the cross. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul believed it. And that it mattered. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attend unto the resurrection of the dead. He had a blessed hope the hope of resurrection. It was the resurrection of Jesus. And for Jesus to be resurrected, he had to die. It matters. The fourth question. What say ye? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Or not? The Jews... Seemingly, believed the word of God on a selective basis. They didn't believe everything. They believed certain things. Selective belief is lethal. They were given the entire counsel of God. And Jesus said to them, you have the scriptures and in them you think you have eternal life, but they are that which testify of me. They did not see the substance in the shadows. And their keeping of the shadows became a lifeless religion of rituals. And they were blind. By unbelief, they were blind to the prophetic nature of the very word they were giving. Any, anyone who selectively believes what the word of God is suffers the same blindness. Oh, this must be true. Oh, I don't understand this, so that one's not true. And there are people like that all over the place. The Jews will see. The Jews will see in Zechariah 12.10. Again, speaking of something yet future to us. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his first born, they will see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they will see him raised, and they will see the pierce. Romans, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Not only will all the Jews see whom they have pierced, all mankind will see whom they have pierced. But the believing see now. Which leads us to the fifth question. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Let me modify that. Are you a secret disciple of Jesus Christ? like Joseph of Arimathea, like Nicodemus. What do silent witnesses need? Boldness. In Acts chapter 4,
Joseph of Arimathea went boldly to Pilate. Acts chapter 4. The church has been born. Starting in verse 23. Peter and John are bearing witness of the truths of God, the truth of Jesus. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up the voice to God, their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord... Behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Before he ascended, Jesus said, Stay in Jerusalem, but you must receive power to be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the Lord. If you're going to be my witness, you must have power. The power of God from on high. If you're a silent witness, what does that mean? You haven't received the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be his witness. It's but for the asking. Yes, Lord, I believe. I know. I know this is true. And I love people who don't know that this is true. And I know what's going to happen to them if they continue in that unbelief. Oh, Lord, give me power to speak your name, to share the gospel with love and with meekness but with boldness. Because I don't have any, I can't manufacture any. Boldness comes from you. I need your boldness to share your truth to the people that you love. And do we live in an antichrist culture? We're not to be silent. The church of God was never to be silent. The church of God is to be boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen the blessed hope. So, if you're a silent witness, if you believe, but you don't share your belief, please cry out. Cry out for the the baptism of the Holy Spirit to receive the power of God to be a witness of Jesus Christ. The last question, just as Joseph of Arimathea craved the body, of Jesus, do we crave the body in order to rest in the completed work of Jesus Christ for our salvation? Or do we somehow think that's not sufficient and we've got to do good works in order to be pleasing to God? No, no, no. We need to enter into the rest of God. Hebrews chapter 4 begins, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, the unbeliever, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we have believed, for excuse me, for we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Yes, be a bold witness. Yes, in all things that you do, do it unto the Lord. 
yes, be busy about the Father's business of seeking and saving the lost. Yes, be vocal in sharing the gospel, but don't think you have to do that to be saved. We do it because we're saved. We don't have to strive to receive the gift. You just receive the gift. One of those gifts is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receive the gifts of God and do because you love him, because you want to do, because you get to do these things. But the issue of salvation, that's done. You know, a godly fear is the fear of missing out on something. Missing out on what God is doing. What God is doing in us and through us. Through us to whom? The people around us. Where he's planted you. Don't miss out (laughs) on what God is doing. Be a part of what God is doing. Amen? So if you'd stand with me, please. Father, we thank you for your word that tells us that Jesus died on the cross and was buried. Believers give testimony. Unbelievers give testimony. You have given testimony that the Lamb of God died and was buried. And that's really really important. (laughs) We know it's not the end of the story. That's coming. But these things are true and they are important. And I ask in Jesus' name that you'd pour out your spirit upon us. All of us who are witnesses, all of us who are believers, Paul, Please pour pour out your spirit upon us to give us the boldness to with great joy preach good news of Jesus Christ in a society that hates him. These are momentous times in which we live. Every time I look at the news every single day, there seems to be another incident of anti-Semitism You said that that would rise in the days before Jesus returns. It is rising. We live on borrowed time. Please, Holy Spirit, come. Come upon us. Empower us. Send us with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.